going to get restarted when Sean lets me. Oh, he is already. Okay, diagnosis for type 2 hypersensitivity, of course, is based on... Um, yeah. Okay, based on... Um, finding the antibodies, and if it is the antibodies are against the endogenous tissue, immunofluorescence is the um, way to detect the antibody. Here it is, uh, again, the same picture coming again. You, you know, this is a good posture diagnosis for good posture uh, that is looking for antibodies or detecting antibodies against uh, um, the basement membrane. Could be lung tissue or uh, renal tissue. Uh, that's why good, in good posture syndrome, there is always damage both to lungs and uh, kidney. Okay. Um, so that, that and, and the treatment, obviously, in the case of drug-induced, obviously, will be to stop that drug and then wait till the antibodies are, have disappeared. And if it is autoimmune, unfortunately, there is no therapy. It is only a treatment, symptomatic treatment, okay, for those conditions anti-inflammatory agents, immunosuppressive agents, uh, that uh, you have a list of in your uh, most commonly used ones that you have in your um, transplantation handout. Okay, now moving on to type 3. Before I move on to type 3, if you compare and contrast, they are both require what immune components? Antibody. Antibody. Okay, so they're both antibody-mediated. In terms of onset of reaction, immediate, the, the immediate hypersensitivity is referred to as immediate because the skin reaction is within 15 to 20 minutes, max 30 minutes, okay? So that's why it's called immediate. Not to say that there are other symptoms that will, that will start, you know, a little bit delayed because of the synthesize the, 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 the molecules that need to be synthesized, not pre-synthesized ones. Uh, but it is immediate, so time frame is different. Unfortunately, you cannot give any time frame to the uh, type 2 hypersensitivity because antibody depend on where the antibody is, where the tissue is. Uh, Complement activation is immediate, so it could be minutes, that like we refer to in um, um, hyperacute graft rejection or it could be a few hours, okay, for the reaction to build up. So there's no time frame for that. Those are the two characteristic features to contrast the, the type 1 and type 2. Common features, both type 1, both antibody mediated. What's the difference between the antibody? One is IgE, one is IgG, or it could be IgM. Okay, so moving on to the type 3, Again, what is type th uh, for reaction? Um, serum thickness, you saw one example in your POPs exercise, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about serum thickness. It's called serum thickness because that's how it was detected. What happened is that in the 50s and 60s, early, late 50s, early 60s, in California at the Scripps Clinic, there was a physician and immunologist combined you know, the physicians, a lot of physicians may still go into research, and, but there, there was a trend that a lot of physicians went into pure research, okay? And he was interested in lupus and arthritis caused by immune complexes. And what he did, he injected rabbits with foreign proteins. He injected rabbits with foreign proteins, uh, I don't remember what protein it was, but uh, and then monitored their blood for presence of antibodies, immune complexes, presence of antigen, and clinical symptoms in those rabbits. And what he saw was, and those clinical symptoms were a rise in temperature, fever, uh, joint problems, limping of rabbits, swelling of joints, and also histology of joints to look at the inflammation. And what he found, 
that, of course, the total antigen, as you saw when Dr. Mayer showed, I think this is the slide you showed? No, but they're very similar one, that there was um, total antigen was dropping sharply because of equilibration and then catabolism, and then after that it plateaued a little bit, and then it started dropping again as the antibodies were being produced. And as the antibodies were produced, so of course there was a large amount injected into these rabbits, just like the humans with tetanus for passive immunization, or more like a snake bite for passive immunization. Free antigen was also there, but there came a time that there was both immune complexes and free antigen in the presence of antibody. And those immune complexes are soluble immune complexes, and they are small, small complexes. And he observed that in, during this period, there was nephritis and arthritis and erythema, all sorts of reactions in these rabbits. Okay? And that is what he uh, named serum sick. So now you know what, where the word serum sickness comes from, because it was foreign serum injected into these rabbits. Okay, the same reaction takes place in, during passive immunization with heterologous sera, heterologous, heterologous gamma globulin. Okay, and as the amount of antibody increased, these immune complexes disappeared, the antigen disappeared, and these symptoms disappeared as well. <clears throat> so they resolved. Unfortunately, in the human, the, the best example of immune complex disease or type 3 hypersensitivity that is naturally occurred, that naturally occurs is lupus, and the persistence of the antigen, you can't get rid of all the nuclei from the body, from the dying cells, and the antibody persists as well, and you've got the continuous production of immune complexes. Okay, the types of uh, the, the, uh, um, the where one sees the type three hypersensitivity is not just autoimmune diseases or passive immunization, but one also sees uh, during persistent infections, particularly viral infections. But uh, you know that doesn't exclude bacterial infections because there is persistent uh, presence of foreign antigen, and of course body keeps on producing antibodies, and there will be immune complexes formed, and you are going to get um, damage to different organs depending where these immune complexes get deposited. Erythema is one of them, the, you know, vasculitis, arthritis, or um, uh, nephritis. Okay? Inhale antigen, mold, plant, or animal antigens, if it is IgE production in certain genetically predisposed individuals, it will be type 1 hypersensitivity. In others, it will be, it can be type 3 hypersensitivity. Okay? And often inhale, if it is inhaled antigens, it will be lung, uh, okay, a damage. And aspergillosis is one of those conditions, mold, against mold. Okay? Um, injected serum material, and that's the example you saw in the POPs exercise, and there again, kidney, lung, arteries, joints, skin, all of those tissues can be involved as type 3 hypersensitivity. Yes? Sir, can you put up the mold of plant and animal? But if it's like production of IgE, that one? Okay. The question is that why, how come that I'm talking about both types of hypersensitivity for a particular antigen, for a particular mold or particular exogenous antigen? Hypersensitivity is not confined. You cannot classify as that this antigen will only cause this hypersensitivity. And I'll give you an example of that. Penicillin I used an example. When you go to the doctor, what does he ask you? First thing. Are you allergic to any antibiotics before he prescribes you antibiotics? Why? Because if you have type 1 hypersensitivity to that, you're going to go into anaphylaxis. Okay? If you have got type 2 hypersensitivity, like I showed you in the case of immune hemolytic anemia due to penicillin binding to the red cells and causing that, it will be type 2. But if it is, you know, if it is complex with some proteins, as a haptin, 
and there's IgG antibodies against it, it can cause type 3 as well, forming immune complexes. So you don't confine yourself into a box that this agent will cause this hypersensitivity only. It depends on what type of immune product there is. Okay? So same antigen, same bacterial antigen and same mold can cause type 3 and type 1 as well. Okay? And even in some cases, type 4 as well. So don't box yourself that this antigen, type 1, this agent. Now, the pollens, and there are certain agents that have this property, chemical property, the protein structures, such that they cause more type 1, more IgE response than IgE, than other responses. Okay? All right. So uh, injected material serum, you saw the um, immune complex nef uh, uh, nephritis or serum sickness there, kidney involved, skin, arteries, and joints. Autoimmune diseases, SLE is the best example in where the antibodies are against, um, and that's just not the SLE, it's nuclear antigen, but if it happened to have, if it happened to have be any other soluble antigen, and it is in the, in the body in the large quantity, you're going to get immune complexes, soluble immune complexes, and you can get um, the same thing with other antigens as well. But lupus is the best example, most prominent one. Okay, serum sickness, yes, you saw that before when we were talking about um, serum sickness previously, um, in the case of passive immunization. Okay, here's a typical characteristic lupus-like lupoid rash, um, SLE patient, and if one took anti serum from this and put it on a rat tissue section of a rat liver, that's most often used, on a slide, fixed on a slide, put that serum on, wash off anything that's unbound, and put the antibodies against immunoglobulin that are tagged with fluorescein, these cells, these nuclei will be stained. And that's how the, the anti-nuclear antibody uh, uh, test for diagnosis used to be done. Now there are latex particles and other things that are coated with nuclear material, and they agglutinate, and you can get, that's called passive agglutination, of course, and that's how you can detect those as well, anti-nuclear antibodies. There are many ways of detecting it or titrating it. But most often for tissue antigens, you use immunofluorescence, indirect immunofluorescence. Okay. There is a test, uh, there is a reaction you will see described in your books, particularly in the older books, but newer, newer books as well, and there is a term given R-thus, R-thus reaction. And what it is is that you inject a small amount of antigen under the skin, and if the patient, the individual, and it was done actually in rabbits, and if the rabbit has got antibodies against that antigen, obviously it will form immune complexes under the skin in the local area, and there will be a, an arithmetic reaction. And that is referred to as Arthur's reaction, if you see it, if you read it anywhere. So it's a very localized immune complex reaction in an experimental situation or in an artificial situation. No. This is, reaction is in the skin, and we'll come to the TP skin test later. This reaction occurs within uh, hours, okay? Within hours. And, of course, the other, uh, com uh, contrasting this with the type 1 hypersensitivity, where there's a wheel and flare. Wheel is the thickening, soft thickening, edematous thickening of the skin, local skin. That's wheel. And the flare is the inflammation that is around it. You can see a little bit of it, but not very obvious because of the contrast. But there is, uh, you know, uh, the flaring, flare part of it as well. Okay. The, what is the mechanism? Again, you'll go through, we'll go through the same boring thing. That's in turn, the soluble antigen. 
be it in, inside the body or be it a pathogen from a pathogen or whatever it can may come from outside, processed by the Mac, you know, APC, the presentation, and I'll go very quickly, CH2 cells again, because it's a humoral immune response, antibody response. Uh, IL-4, 5, and any other cytokines that are necessary for, that, for IgG production. Most of the time, these are IgG molecules. The B cells that get activated, plasma cells, and then antibodies are produced. And the same antigen, if it is endogenous, it will be present all the time. If it's exogenous, it's a persistent infection, it is in the body as well. And they will, find, uh, you know, in the presence of excess amount of antigen, because in the body has got abundance of those antigens, and antibodies are you know, being produced slowly, uh, there will be immune complexes in antigen excess, and those immune complexes will be, obviously, um, soluble. They cannot be cleared very quickly if they're very small. And those get deposited. Where are, is this reaction taking place? Most of the time in the circulation, blood circulation, in blood, uh, the blood vessels. And here is a sort of cartoon of a blood vessel, and here is immune complex for, being formed. As the immune complex being formed, what do you see? What do you get? What's the next reaction? Complement activation. Okay? Activation of complement leads to production of what? complement products, okay? Most significant among those, as Dr. Mayer must have emphasized, is C3A and C5A, okay? Anaphylatoxin. Also, there is C2B, which is the prokinin that gets further processed to become kinin, vasodilatation, Okay? Or, or leakiness of those blood vessels, capillaries, the junctions, you know, cell junctions become wider. And there is also activation of platelets. Platelets tend to aggregate with immune complexes. Activation of those platelets, again, those pharmacologically active substances cause this widening of the junction. The C5A attracts neutrophils there. Neutrophils interact with them. They release toxic substances. So there's a buildup of inflammation because of the persistence of immune complexes. Uh, basophils as well as neutrophils. This is the basophil, I'm sorry. Basophils are because of the complement activation product. Okay, but immune complexes also attract neutrophils. Sorry, I didn't. See that one. Here's the neutrophil for you. Okay? And this reaction is taking place around the capillary wall. That's where it is being widened. Okay? As it is gets, you know, the gap, intercellular junction gaps become larger, they creep down into the sub-basement membrane. Okay? And they can cause damage to the leakiness of these blood vessels. So the red cells can leak out, and that is leads to erythema, of course. If it is happening in the, uh, the, the kidney, glomeruli, there's a lot of capillaries there that are responsible for dialysis, okay, in those glomeruli. They're going to come, come out of those blood capillaries, cause damage to the renal basement membrane and lead to, to nephritis, okay? So I have given you all the components that take part after formation of immune complex. Now, why do we not get immune complexes like that uh, every time? And why don't, so, uh, every, doesn't, don't all people get nephri uh, lupus nephritis or immune complex disease? I'll come to that later. In the case of infection, you've got an infection, antibody comes along and wipes the nonspecific immune system, and then the antibody comes along, wipes the infection very quickly. They don't persist very long, okay? But we do get that in persistent infections, those type three hypersensitivity reaction. As a matter of fact, in some diseases, that is the mechanism by how bacteria cause the symptoms. 
Okay? The, the, the immune complexes. Why don't, doesn't everybody in the population get immune complex disease? Why some people? Well, it was, the, a lot of the experimentation was done in mice. And they found that in the antibodies that form very small complexes or t- transient immune complexes tend to develop more they persist, these immune complexes persist longer in the circulation, and the longer they persist, the more inflammation they're going to cause. And what type of antibodies would you think that they would um, persist for a, a lot longer? Low affinity antibodies. Okay? Lower the affinity, low, therefore lower the avidity, and they will dissociate more often, and the immune complexes are going to be persisting will be smaller and persist longer. Lower binding, more dissociation, smaller complexes persisting longer. And they have shown that there are certain strains of mice that develop more immune complex diseases and they tend to produce lower affinity antibodies. So there's a direct correlation with the affinity of antibody and the uh, immune complex formation. And if you remember also, one can just sort of you know, connect dots. Dr. McCallop, when he's talking about uh, B1 cells, CD5 positive B1 cells, low affinity antibody more involved in autoimmune diseases. And autoantibodies generally are of low affinity. Okay? So there's an association. And therefore, there's a genetic predisposition as well. Certain people with certain HLA types Okay, we tend more to develop autoimmune diseases, certain autoimmune diseases. Okay, if what was what would one find if one looked at the kidney bi- biopsy of uh, uh, in the glomeruli? Obviously, there will be immune complexes deposited there, and those immune complexes can be detected by either staining them, treating them with immunofluorescein anti-immunoglobulins, or anti-complement component. Anti-C3 can be used there, because wherever there are immune complexes, there will be complement components as well. So immunofluorescent staining with anti-immunoglobulin fluorescein conjugated anti-immunoglobulin is going to give you a staining pattern like this. And again, I will reiterate and repeat the same thing. If there are immune complexes, they're not going to very, very sort of discreetly distribute themselves. No, they're going to be in lumps. And this pattern of staining actually once was referred to lumpy, bumpy staining. More often you'll see the word granular staining. And this is smooth, linear staining. Where do you see that? If we have just talked about what this autoimmune disease? Good postures. Whereas this you see more often in SLE or post streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Okay? Diagnosis. <clears throat> there are many ways of, of course, the symptomatic diagnosis. Once you suspect that there may be immune complex disease, one can look for anti-nuclear antibodies. If it is lupus, uh, uh, SLE is suspected. Or one can look at the circulation serum. They, they take the blood and uh, look uh, for antibodies against, um, um, look for immune complexes. Or one, whenever there's immune complexes and the complement is being activated, what do you think will be happening to complement? It's going to be used up, consumed. Anything that's consumed drops down in quantity. Okay? So people with immune complex disease have lower hemolytic complement titers, lower CH50s and normal. So that can be used as an indication uh, of that. Directly immune complexes can be detected either directly by putting through a sort of la- across a laser light an, an instrument known, known as le- nephilometer, nephilometer, where it just detects almost very, very low levels of turbidity. Okay? So nephilometry can be used. Or immune complexes are going to activate C1 or combine C1. So what one can do is 
um, do that. So we'll go through one at a time. Uh, these immune complexes are too small to really clump together and cause turbidity. One can use something like polyethylene glycol that tends to encourage clumping of immune complexes, and then um, they, they can precipitate by immune that, uh, or, <clears throat> yeah, they, they will precipitate, <clears throat> and one can quantitate by in that precipitate. Or here is a complement base, C1Q can be attached to a solid surface, and then <clears throat> a serum with immune complexes can be uh, exposed and can be put into the same well or plate where there's a, these C1Q molecules are. And now if you use anti-immunoglobulin antibodies that are either radio-labeled or some other detection molecule, you can see the binding of radioactivity here, and counting that radioactivity will give you an index of immune complexes. Okay, so those are the different. In your handout, I don't know if I have mentioned a test, Raji cell test. I have not seen it as being asked in exams or anything like that lately. What it simply is, there's a cell line called Raji cell, and you can treat. What it has is it has got a receptor for FC receptor. And of course, immune complexes, when they're complex, they will combine with the FC receptor of any cell. Okay, and this is a laboratory cell line. You can use that for binding of immune complexes and detecting that by radioactivity. So if I have not mentioned it in the handout, I have not seen it being asked in the exams lately, but just in case, I'm just telling you what is a Raji cell test. Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now, so that is end treatment again in anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive or anti-inflammatory drugs. So, <clears throat> Now we can go back and contrast or compare the three types of hypersensitivity. Type 1 is based on IgE, antibody, right? And immediate, within 30 minutes. Type 2, based on antibodies, but not IgE. Instead, it may be IgM or IgG that fixes complement or attracts neutrophils, activates platelets, Antigen is, can be endogenous or exogenous. Reaction time is not defined in this case, varies. In the, in the, uh, in the affected area, you're going to detect what? In this case of type 1, you'll get inflammatory cells, but eosinophils and basophils there, more abundant. In the case of type 2, you will get complement deposits immunoglobulin deposit and complement deposit, in the, uh, and, uh, and also some platelets and neutrophils. In the case of type 3 hypersensitivity, you will see immune complexes, immunoglobulin is mediated by antibody, and it could be, it is usually IgG, usually IgG. IgM complexes are usually large, and then they are cleared very quickly because of pentavalence, remember? Antivalent antibodies there. Okay. <clears throat> so, or, or decavalent, actually. There are 10 theoretical combining sites there. All right. So, um, then um, type 3 is based on immune complex. It's non-organ specific. Type 2 is organ specific, more or less. <clears throat> Okay, now we can come to type 4 hypersensitivity. It's very different from all other three. It's also known as cell-mediated hypersensitivity. And why is it known as cell-mediated hypersensitivity? I'll give you a little bit of background. You've heard humoral immune response and cell-mediated immune response, antibody-mediated or cell-mediated. In the the early to mid-19th century, there were physicians and scientists, immunologists. They were interested in what protects the body, what protects the, us against infections. And they were used to seeing that, okay, tetanus and various other 
pathogens, you know, antibodies, okay? They did experiments where they infected an animal with TB organisms, okay? Those that recovered it, or they immunized, actually, they, they infected and recovered or immunized, it's uh, amounts the same thing. And they were protected. These animals were protected. And what they did is they took out serum from that animal and inject, injected into naive animals. And then challenged those animals with same organisms. They were used to seeing that if it was tetanus or diphtheria or other bacterial infections, they recovered. They were protected. The recipients of the serum were protected. However, when they infect, the infected animal, the immune animal, was immune to mycobacterium, and they transferred the serum from that animal to naive animal, the recipients were not protected. So antibodies were not doing anything. And they said, okay, serum antibody doesn't protect, but the animal is protected. And they knew enough about lymphoid organs that were involved in immune responses, so they took out lymph nodes from those animals, protected animals, and transferred into new naive animals, and then challenged those recipients. And lo and behold, they were protected. So they called it cell-mediated immunity because it could be transferred from animal to another animal by transferring cells. And that's why the word cell-mediated or humoral immunity. Okay. <clears throat> the, uh, the best example of that is tuberculin reaction, TB test. Uh, you have all been tested. I know that you have all been tested. I was tested as well, but not as a student, but when I was a uh, uh, candidate for um, U.S. citizenship. They won't give you a U.S. citizenship. The natives can be tubercul tuberculous, uh, you know, infected with the TB. It doesn't matter, but the, anybody from outside, they have got to be tested and they have got to be cleared or treated before they receive that status. Anyway, in most classes, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't feel like it, most classes, I, or I see one, in many classes I've seen one person who has been positive. Okay? Okay? What it is, it does not mean that you have got TB. I, anybody who was born and grew up in England or some of the European countries I mentioned to you before, is going to be positive because they're immunized. Okay? Because they're immunized. And so, I'll ask the person who said that they were tested positive, when did they ask you to come back after injecting tuberculin antigen? After how long? For observation. About three days, right? 48 to 72 hours. Okay? Is the reaction time. Actually, here, 36 to 48. You start seeing 36 peaks around 48 or thereabouts. So, remember that what, what the time frame was for type 1 hypersensitivity in minutes. That's why immediate. Here is a 48 hours. That's why it's referred to as delayed hypersensitivity as well. Okay. <clears throat> Tuberculin test is the most example. But that is not the only one. There's lepromin test for leprosy, you know, there is um, uh, for Leishmanin, for in Leishmania infections, all sorts of, you know, you can, uh, ha there are antigens that are used for diagnosis or for um, testing reactivity to that particular antigen. And the tuberculin test is very different. Uh, those of you who were positive, were you also allergic? Uh, has had the skin test for allergies? No. Okay. You know that the, 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 if you were, you will have a different reaction to different type of reaction. Wheel and flare skin reaction in the case of type 1 hypersensitivity. 
Whereas in this case, there is a little bit of erythema, okay, erythema, but in duration. In duration is hardening, a raised, hardened, raised skin manifestation. Um, so it is different from that. There is another type of delayed hypersensitivity, type 4 hypersensitivity that I'll describe that is not edematous, but is maculopapular that the later on. But uh, by and large, tuberculin test, tuberculin test is certainly um, erythema and induration. And we'll talk about what, what that induration is due to. And, but there is the other reaction that I'm talking about, as opposed to this hard and um, arithmetic reaction, not very visible here, but there is a rash and that, then the mac, macropapular reaction, the small little papules. And this is referred to as dermatitis, contact dermatitis. And the best example of that contact dermatitis is poison ivy, poison oak reaction, and also latex contact sensitivity, latex contact dermatitis. Rubber, latex, rubber compounds, a lot of chemicals. People get allergic to, actually, we had one technician, what, a long time ago, what, about 20 years ago, 15 years ago? We had to stop her from handling anything pathogens or anything that, um, because all the people, the lab workers that were handling pathogens, they wore gloves. And boy, within a few days after she started working with those, she came with a nasty, you know, most severe uh, rash, contact dermatitis to that. So there are lots of people. Um, people are allergic to detergent. In detergent, they're not really allergic to soap. What it is that they use some bacteria as a source of enzymes, proteolytic enzymes. Okay? So people are allergic to those become allergic to those, and they can't handle that. That's contact dermatitis. And that's not only that. Here's an example. The active substance that is responsible for, and I think Dr. May showed you this structure as well. Not, not this year, okay. The, you know, pentadega catechol is the compound, it's a haptin that is in poison ivy leaves and poison oak leaves. And people get sensitized to that. How do they get sensitized? They get exposed to it. The haptin combines with proteins. There's lots of uh, foreign proteins sitting on my skin, different organisms, flora, skin flora. They, they are sensitized to that. And then when they come in contact with that, after being sensitized, depending on degrees of sensitization, they are going to come up with these reactions. And these reactions usually are a little bit, little bit faster than the tuberculin test. So you may start getting it, seeing it 24 or late, you know, 36 hours later. Okay. Here's another interesting example. Look at that finger. He did not really put the finger, you know, um, imprint there with a red pen or red ink. He was enjoying uh, probably in some tropical place like Miami or Southern Florida or some other place, and mangoes are very common, and he enjoyed mangoes. He was eating mangoes and just sat there with his hand there, and a couple of days later, he sees this imprint on the thigh. And uh, this was published, this case was published in New England Med uh, Med Journal of Medicine a few years ago, and I like that, you know, sort of gives the message, you know, across. Um, and he had this reaction because he was sensitized to mango sap. And where they, it comes off the branch, there's a lot of sap there. Okay. Nickel. Heavy metals. People get sensitized to. Uh, people in the old days, thimble. Those who were, were thimbles. You all know what thimble is? Okay. Some people do. Anybody doesn't know what thimble is? It's a finger protecting device that you use for sewing. The needles don't hurt that finger. They become sensitized to that because there's nickel in it. Um, garter belts. There was 
they were popular at one time. Okay? And people get sensitized to that. Ah, well. People who, they, they think that they're drinking a little bit of old Milwaukee might help. No, that's not a treatment for that. They may feel very good about it. Okay, and forget the, uh, the rash and you know, discomfort, but they are, okay. So that, that's, those are the things. Pathogens, a lot of pathogens. Tuberculosis, tubercle bacillus does not have any toxin that it can damage the host. What it does is forms granulomas. And those granulomas are the ones that are destroying the tissue, and that is those granulomas are due to type 4 hypersensitivity. And those granulomas develop when I come to the mechanisms. I'll tell you what, what, what causes the granuloma formation. Leprosy is another. Leishmaniasis is another. There are many, many, many diseases, particularly those pathogens that are intracellular organisms. Antibodies can't get to them, right? So it's a cell-mediated immunity that is protective, but during the process of protection, it also causes granuloma formation. And if the antigen pathogen is not eliminated by treatment, as in the case of leprosy or untreated tuberculosis, those granulomas are going to get larger and larger and affect the organ where they are located. When we come to the parasitology, you'll see some awful pictures of people that have been infected with uh, leishmania and not treated. <clears throat> okay, so here is, um, that's probably the, uh, yeah, here is the uh, comparison of different delayed hypersens hypersensitivity skin reactions, contact dermatitis, a little bit earlier you can see it, uh, but um, it is still delayed compared to other hypersensitivity reactions. And um, it's characterized by eczematous appearance, macropapules, uh, histology of that um, tissue. We'll show you T cells and later macrophages in the infiltrate. <clears throat> uh, the antigens and site in, uh, affected is epidermal. Uh, and the agents that are responsible for it are heavy metals, poison, ivy, rubber, latex, poison oak, so forth. <clears throat> uh, tuberculin reaction, 40, again, for the delayed, 48 to 70 hours, local in duration as opposed to eczematous. Uh, lymphocytes and monocytes involved, intradermal, uh, tuberculin, Lepromin are the antigens most commonly for the pathogens. Granulomas. Now, in granulomas, there's growth and hardened lesion. Inside the body, they are usually within the muscles. They are, if one looks at the biopsy, one will see macrophages and giant cells. Giant cells are fused macrophages. Okay? And epithelioid cells, fibroblasts are there. And it is due to persistent antigenic stimulus, and such as in chronic infection. Yes. Tuberculin is a protein that is extracted from mycobacterium tuberculosis, and lepromin is similarly a protein that is extracted from. Uh, microbacterium lepri. But what's the tuberculosis? Tuberculosis is the name of the disease, is the component derived from mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay? And you will see the word leishmanin and various other, you know, things, what, you know, the test uh, was, and the name itself says, when it says I-N, N-I-N, that means that it is the protein derived from that particular organism. Okay, so this is the different types of hypersensitivity and what you're going to see. Um, I think I'll take a break. I'm fairly ahead, you know, uh, not ahead, but that's okay. I'm on time. I'll, I'll do this one.
when I come back tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is not, tomorrow is Pops. Tomorrow is Pops on Monday, Tuesday.